church to strengthen you, to minister to you. I pray that I'll be a ministry. And I don't know about you, but I love being apostolic. Our brother said, I love being apostolic. I love being Pentecostal. Someone told a Pentecostal, a Pentecostal man one time, he said, you know, all that shouting and dancing and arm raising and boisterous stuff, he said, all that stuff isn't really necessary. And the Pentecostal thought for me, he said, you know, you might be right. He said, it might not be necessary, but neither is taking a bath or a shower. But you sure feel better afterward. And then he said, and you're a whole lot more pleasant to be around afterward. I love being Pentecostal and apostolic, and I love having neighboring pastors like your pastor. So give honor to all and to him tonight. Don't you love your pastor? Amen. I've been praying for him, praying for Sister Blankenship. I know you're going through some difficult, challenging times, but I want to preach to you tonight about revival. And when I talk about revival tonight, I am not referring to the global moving of the Spirit in the sense that something is coming. That's already here. Harvest, revival in terms of the end time, I believe that's here. I believe we're in revival. But tonight when I refer to revival, I'm talking about and referencing certain breakthroughs, times when we go through seasons of difficulty, talking about those moments for us as individuals and as a church where God answers prayer. We Maybe gone, anybody gone through some stuff? The rest of you are either lying or you better hold on tight. Something's about to break forth. We all go through stuff, experience highs and lows, and so we are all going to need at some point revival in our lives. And so I want to direct our attention to the book of 1 Samuel chapter 16. Just preach a little bit about revival tonight. Is that all right? 1 Samuel chapter 16 and verse number 7, the Bible says, But the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. And then we find this next portion of this verse, what I have often called the most comforting and yet most disturbing verse in the Bible because the Lord says to Samuel, I refused him for the Lord seeth not as man seeth. For man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. That same verse renders in the New Living Translation like this, but the Lord said to Samuel, don't judge by his appearance or height for I have rejected him. And then it says the Lord doesn't see things the way you see them. Aren't you thankful for that? People judge by outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Would you put your Bibles down and join me just for a moment of prayer. Ask the Lord's blessing upon the time we have together, upon the word of the Lord that I'm going to share with you, upon our response to that word. Let's lift our voice and let's pray together. Father, we love you. Thank you for your blessings. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your mercy. And thank you for the opportunity to be in the house of God. Thank you for the body of Christ. Lord, minister to your people tonight. Give direction to us, Lord Jesus. Answer tonight prayers that have been prayed. Strengthen tonight areas where they've been weak. God, people, individually and collectively, this body, this church, I pray, Lord, that you would minister strength in the name of Jesus. Somebody shout in Jesus' name. Say it again, in Jesus' name. Amen. Before you're seated, why don't you high-five somebody, hug somebody's neck, tell them, I hope he doesn't preach too long tonight. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. Amen. It is good, before I get started, it's good to have some of my home folks with me tonight. Thank you for coming and supporting your pastor. Amen. Some new lifers. Honored to have my wife and my daughter with me tonight. I want to preach to you from the thought, revival will be wearing a red rose. Revival will be wearing a red rose. I'm I'm sure everyone in here can answer in the affirmative this evening that 
you have either heard and likely possibly you've even used the familiar term that beauty is only skin deep. Anybody heard that before? Probably some have used it. Of course, this phrase seeks to capture the truth that looks can be deceiving. The appearance of beauty is not everything there is. For instance, when you're trying to find a spouse, there's always a need to know someone or to know something deeper than that surface appearance, if you will. I'm going to try very hard not to sound carnal. Just stick with me for a minute. But let me just say, I've seen some very attractive women in my life. And Bishop, after about five minutes of being around them, I thank God they were married to someone besides me. Hallelujah. I'm sure there's been some on the other side of that coin. The ladies in the house could say that. So about some men they've met. And so the advice is sound that when you're seeking uh, for love, for instance, that remember, beauty is only skin deep. It's not everything. Now, that said, I've got a beautiful wife, so I'm just going to say it don't hurt none either. Praise God. Hallelujah. All the men in the house should say amen right there. All the married men, at least. Hallelujah. <laughs> beauty don't hurt. You just can't use beauty alone to gauge the relationship. In fact, it is an obvious truth that you do not build relationships on the looks of things alone. Those that have, and there have been many that have, they have found out after the honeymoon is over that they are completely unequally yoked together. They have made perhaps an egregious error, and many stick it out. And, of course, we know by the divorce rate that many do not. And uh, some families, some husbands and wives, they get stuck in the cycle of what my pastor used to describe as the checkpoint of marriage. The checkpoint of marriage is where you go from the high to that kind of dip, that lower point. What I mean by that is you go from where you married Prince Charming and then it becomes that guy that has some horrific smelling socks about halfway through the day. And before it bounces back up to good, you kind of hit that divot in the checkpoint and you, you married that beauty and then find out she's got... Got some bad breath in the morning. Hallelujah. The realization that maybe there's a bit of delusion that your mate isn't as close to perfection as you had previously thought. You found out there are things about that individual that as much as you love them, it frustrates you. And it's, it's then that looks aren't everything. So we realize that to gauge and to build relationships on looks alone is a foolish thing to do. Looks are not, young people, some of you young men, some of you young ladies not yet married, looks are not one of the ingredients that really going to count when you build a successful relationship because something can appear to be something that it is not. So when we as people gauge our actions and our decisions in life simply by what it, whatever that may be, seems to be, by how it feels or by how it appears, there will be some mistakes made and indeed amazing promises will be missed out upon. In fact, when we look into the scripture, we see some individuals that made some very important decisions simply by what things looked like. When Abraham sent and rather stood with his nephew Lot and it came time for the parting of ways, they had increased in herds, so much so, many of you know the story, their tribesmen couldn't get along. They had come to a point that they had to go their separate ways in order to keep the peace. And Lot was given a choice. He was given a decision to make as to where he would dwell. And he made the choice totally based upon the looks of things. He saw the well-watered plains of Sodom and Gomorrah and he chose to take his family and his possessions to that area because it looked like the ideal place for him to prosper. It looked like the best and it looked like what he had dreamt about and never did he stop to investigate. He didn't pause long enough to ponder the atmosphere that he would be injecting his, his family into. Never never stopped to consider the spiritual consequence of that decision. And if you know the story, you know the tragedy. 
His family became consumed with the sin of the city so much that when God destroyed the city, Lot could only save two of his daughters, two other of his daughters, their families, and his wife, Lot's wife, perished as a direct result of his decision that was made by the appearance of the territory and how it appealed to his fleshly nature. Let me just pause right here for a minute and tell somebody, I I don't even know who this is for, but I feel led to say it. Your decisions are almost as important as your prayers. Oh, I can feel a little bit just like, well, wait a minute now. You don't believe me? Let me take you to the Garden of Eden for just a minute. Huh? Let me just stop by a tree for a second. The Bible says that Adam and Eve walked with the Lord every day. They communed with him in the cool of the day every day. And after, yet we find Eve visiting a tree and ruining her life. Let me say it like this. Eve walked out of her prayer meeting to be beguiled by the serpent. Let me just say it. Your decisions and your obedience are as important as your prayer meeting. You cannot make right decisions without a prayer meeting, but you can walk in disobedience in spite of your prayer meeting. Hello, somebody. And let me just say this for somebody. I don't know who I'm helping. If you walk out of your prayer closet into disobedience, you might need to reevaluate what's happening in prayer time. Decisions and choices in our lives cannot always be decided upon what looks right or what feels right, but it's got to matter what is right. I wonder sometimes how many people have missed out on the kingdom of God and the will of God because they gauged it by what things looked like. I wonder sometimes how many have missed out on a close personal relationship with Jesus Christ because the appearance of things didn't seem to be what they were looking for. While while all the other times, other things appealed to their carnal nature. Israel did that. They crucified the Messiah that they said they wanted. Because he did not come looking like what they wanted him to look like. He didn't come packaged the way that he ought to. He didn't come with the same itinerary that they had their Messiah on. They were thinking of an earthly ruler. They were thinking of earthly dominion, carnal nature type things. They were seeking the restoration of the kingdom back to the days of David, back to the days of of Solomon, but the Messiah was concerned far more with the things of eternity and with what mankind truly needed like salvation and forgiveness of sins and hope and peace and joy and love and restoration to God, not restoration to earthly authority, but kingdom authority, victory over sin, victory over death. Aren't you thankful that that's what his agenda included? And yet they rejected the very one they had prayed for, the one they had told their children about. Understand that that Jewish tradition and parents, they often talked about. It was a part of everything that they were. Someday Messiah will come. Someday Messiah will come. And the very thing they lived their life looking for, many of them rejected because he wasn't packaged like they expected. Anybody in here like getting gifts? You got a bunch of liars in here, Bishop. My goodness. I brought the wrong message. They've been quiet all day. (laughs) Hallelujah. Anybody like gifts? Come on now. We talk about Christmas. I love to decorate. I I am a product of Bill Douglas and Kay Douglas 100%. I, I love to decorate. I love beautiful wrapping paper. But I'm just going to tell you, when it comes to wrapping the gifts, I let my wife do that. Because these fat fingers, I got like seven yards of paper left over sometime. I don't know what happened. 
Use like three things of that scotch tape just for one or two gifts. I, I leave that up to her. But I'm going to tell you something. You buy me a gift, Christmas or any other time, you don't even have to wrap that bad boy. You can leave it in the plastic bag that the, you brought it from the store or Amazon delivered it in. I, I'm not going to reject it. Because can you imagine someone saying, I don't like the appearance of the gift, so I'm not interested in the gift. Not on your life. Listen to me. When it comes to the kingdom, I'm not interested in the looks of the wrapping. I'm interested in the gift. I want the product. I want the goods. Let me just stop right here for a minute. Maybe I'm talking to someone in this place right now and you have thought about living for God and you've, you've, you've been for some time on the proverbial fence of stepping further into the longings of the heart of God and your heart longs to dive into God's ways but you're still caught by concerns of what might others think, what my family might say and the appearance looks at times. Like it might involve some discipline and denial. I don't know if I want to live that way. I don't know if I want to sell out. I don't know if I like how it looks. I'm going to have to live a little differently. I'm going to have to talk a little differently. And the, I'm going to have to sacrifice some flesh in me. You hear this preacher. Can I just talk to somebody? I don't care what level you're at in the spirit. If God's appealing to you, and I promise you he is, to go a little further, to go a little deeper, don't you pass up the greatest gift. God, come down to man. The gift of the Holy Ghost. The anointing of God on a life. Don't you miss his promise because of uncertainty based on appearance. Israel wanted the Messiah and they missed him because he didn't look like what they had thought he should. As I mentioned, there are several scriptural illustrations, but we read specifically of one. Many of us are familiar with Samuel being sent to anoint a new king. He arrives at the house of Jesse, and we know the story. Jesse has all of his sons, or at least that's what Samuel thought. All of his sons are lined up, and, and we know from the account of Scripture, but we kind of can read between the lines. The first one was Eliab, and if you read the account in 1 Samuel 16, you'll see that when Eliab walked into the presence of Samuel, the prophet immediately begins to think, that's it. That's the one. That is the one that is going to bring revival to Israel. Surely he's the one. Why? Because Eliab fit the appearance of what you'd look for in a king. He was the eldest. He was like me, very stout and ruggedly handsome and built. And he was, My wife said amen. amen. Oh, man, I'm doing good. I don't care what the rest of you say. Brother Bimbry, he looked right. Folks, let me just stop right here and minister for a minute. Samuel almost missed what the Lord would have him to do. Can you imagine if Samuel had missed it that day? Would we even have many of the Psalms that we have? We're talking about David. The, the very lineage of Jesus Christ would look entirely different. David, the man after God's heart, Israel's greatest king, all would have been missed, all because a prophet was at first controlled by appearance. And the Lord stopped him and he said, Hold up a second, Samuel. Don't you look at his outward appearance. Because I don't look at man's appearance on the outward. I look at the heart of man. And we know the rest of the story. The very one that was never invited in the first place. Even his own dad. Can you imagine this? Even his own dad was like, well, surely it couldn't be David. I mean, we aren't real sure about that young man yet. I mean, he talks to sheep. God... Samuel, let me just explain before we get him in here. He carries a harp around. I mean, he sings and he writes poetry. 
If anyone sings and writes poetry, please don't be offended. But if you do, Jesus said offenses will come. Praise God. I mean, he said, I'm not sure how this young man's going to turn out just yet. He, why? Because David did not yet have the appearance of Saul. He wasn't yet the man's man and the warrior that he would eventually become because he didn't look like Saul, head and shoulders above everybody. If Samuel ooh, hadn't been able to listen to the Spirit more than judged by appearance, Israel would have missed the greatest king they ever had in their history or God would have had to bring about some other kind of miracle in some other way. And so let me just stop here and tell you, I feel like preaching for a few minutes. Revival and the will of God does not always look like we think it will. I'm going to help somebody. If you desire spiritual things, it is not always going to be wrapped pleasing to your flesh. If you're here tonight desiring and been praying, I want a deeper relationship with Jesus, I'm going to help you. It's probably not going to happen at the most convenient of seasons in your life. Will not come just the way you want it or even the way you envision. Now hear me. To be what God wants you to be. To allow God to do for and in you what he wants to do, it will create some disruption in our lives. It will shake up our priorities. Now listen to me. I'm not one that tries to pull the wool over our eyes. And I love to preach faith, and I often preach the awesome benefits of godliness to which there are none that compare. But I also love God's people enough to tell you that living for God will disrupt some areas of your flesh. Because we have a problem. Everybody wants the amazing benefits of God. And I'm confident in this room there are people that are hungry for renewed revival. You want to see God continue to do awesome things in your church and greater things than this church has ever seen. But if we're controlled by convenience or if we're motivated only by what is the most appealing, if we allow ourselves to get distracted by the disappointments that seek to rock our faith and our trust in the God of heaven, we might miss out on what could be the greatest spiritual opportunity and the greatest revival God has for you collectively and also individually. Because revival and the things of God rarely come packaged in a way that appeals to our flesh. When we think of things like miracles, we often think, of the notable miracles. You know, the, the great physical healings. We, we think in the great, in terms of notable miracles, the great numeric outpourings of the Holy Ghost, that instantaneous move of God. And, and I believe in those. I love those. But some miracles do not start off looking like miracles. I feel the Holy Ghost in this place. I promise you David felt the power of a miracle moment when Samuel poured that oil upon his head. But I'll remind you it was a long way from that moment to the miracle of a shepherd arising and ascending to the throne of Israel. I on the things of God, they come rarely packaged in a way that appeals to our flesh. In fact, let me just tell somebody, sometimes the miracle feels like loneliness at first. Sometimes it feels like loss, almost like you've been forgotten. Sometimes the miracle you've been praying for, God's going to allow you to understand tonight. It feels like almost like you've done something wrong. God, what in the world is going on here? Sometimes miracles and the seed of miracles feel like pain, like you're being cut on surgically. Sometimes, I guess the best way I could describe it is it feels like we're going through a time of winter, a season of being cut off. And harvest doesn't seem like it's ever going to come like we imagined and dreamed it. 
and Holy Ghost revival and outpouring doesn't seem like it's it feels lonely it feels desperate but listen to me David just realize that in the loneliness of the pasture and in the loneliness of the shepherding and in the loneliness of faithfulness God is preparing a king God is preparing a miracle God is preparing a harvest what you can know is that if you're going through some things that are not comfortable to your flesh, i just going to prophesy God is about to unleash some things in the spirit because God has a process of positioning and preparing us where he can prove us trustworthy for that next level. Oh, I love this church. I love your pastor. I highly revere this man and this body. But I'm going to tell you something. Your best days are not behind you. And your greatest days of miracle, revival, and breakthrough are still ahead of you. Hallelujah. I hope somebody in this house would say, Pastor, I'm not content with where we are. I'm not going to allow myself to get comfortable where we are. We're going to the next level. We're going to the next step of revival. Notice something. I said, Samuel almost missed it, but he didn't. And I believe there's a point for the modern church to hear over and over as to why he didn't. Very simply, Samuel was tuned into the Spirit of the Lord. We could go into the whole thing and we don't walk by sight. We don't walk by the things we feel in our flesh and see around us. But let me just say it like this. A body of believers in this way, this apostolic way, we have got to know what it is to be plugged into the Spirit. I'm not talking about Brother Bembry and your leadership. I'm not talking about your bishop. I'm talking about every one of us. If we're part of the apostolic church, we need to know what it is to walk in the spirit. Oh, there's too much at stake for us to not walk in the spirit. That's why you need a couple of important things. Number one, you need the man of God. And as a result of him and your own walk with God, you need the word of God. In the book of Isaiah chapter 55, the prophet Isaiah is speaking to a nation that is in desolation, a nation that is in ruin, a nation that is void of hope, a nation familiar with death even, a a nation having experienced punishment for sin, a nation experiencing that, that cold calculating hand of winter, if you will. Captivity, desolation, doom, defeat, calamity. And he speaks to a nation familiar with what I would probably best describe like I did earlier, a winter season. Anybody been there in your life before? Isaiah starts off, Isaiah 55, he says, to everyone that thirsteth, indicating drought, a season of drought. He said to all of you that don't have no money, and everybody in this house probably say, well, a little witness in the Spirit, indicating a season of lack of resource. And on he goes, talking about the imminence of death. To that nation, we see in verse 6 the very familiar words of, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake their way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. And it says, let them return unto the Lord. And this is why you got to stay plugged into the man of God and plugged into the word of God. He goes on in verse 8, say, put it up there for me. He says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. He says, for as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways. And my thoughts higher than your thoughts. 
And then he says something here that we got to catch a hold of. The whole point I'm making right here about the Word of God. It says, For as the rain cometh down, and the snow from heaven, and returneth not thither, but watereth the whole earth. It says, Maketh it to bring forth, that's revival, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. He says, so shall my word be. It's not going to return void. Uh, Pastor, where, where do we find strength in the face of when things don't look just right? Where do we go for hope when we just are in the middle of that winter time and the appearance of all around us feels gloomy and, and it's doom and, it's, and, it's, and it's, it could be discouraging? How can the hope for the promises of God remain relevant? It doesn't look like God's fulfilling miracles and promises while we're in this grip of a season. Can I just say it like this? You have got to be familiar with getting a hold of the word of God. Go back up. It says, for as the rain. I don't know if you've ever caught this. I hope to help somebody right here. Talking about appearance and the things. It doesn't always look like it's working. It says, for as the rain cometh down. Can I tell you sometimes... The rain, when it falls, Bishop, it immediately produces results. When the rain falls, it begins to put uh, life into the grass and into the, into the seeds that are in the ground. And you see almost immediately life sprouts up. Sometimes the Word of God is like that. Sometimes the Word of God comes and there's an immediate connection to it. There's an immediate springing forth. There's immediate life that is seen. And I'm thankful for those times. But he didn't stop there. He said, as the rain comes and the snow from heaven. My God, I feel the Holy Ghost. We know snow. It blankets. It covers. But it doesn't immediately produce results. But you, I promise you, given it long enough, the spring's going to come. And that snow's going to melt. And it's going to bring forth a harvest. God says in his word, sometimes my word is just going to settle on you. And sometimes it doesn't look like it's working out like I said. But if you can understand, it's like the soul shall my word be. It will spring forth revival. It will spring forth the harvest in the name of Jesus. It will nonetheless cause a time of bringing forth. So shall my word be. Come on, somebody. It may feel like winter in your life right now. It may feel like cut back and loss and loneliness. And it may feel like you're in the icy grip of a seasonal change. But he says further down, as my word goes out, it doesn't return void. You shall, shall go out with joy. You're going to find peace again. The mountains shall break forth. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. There is something in my spirit tonight. I feel led to encourage some faithful saints of God in this assembly. I feel sent to minister to the body of Christ, to the pastor, to the ministry. God has not overlooked your faithfulness. God has not overlooked your trustworthiness. And he has found in Norfolk Apostolic Church a church that he can entrust greater in time harvest. Then we've seen to this point. I'm here to tell somebody there is reward for faithfulness. It may not always feel like it, may not always look like it, but there's a revival and a breakthrough and a harvest in spite of frustrations, in spite of disappointments. Come on, somebody, don't allow yourself to fall into discouragement and disappointment. Don't let it rob your faith and expectation. Keep your prayer going. Keep your fasting going. Keep giving yourself even when it hurts the flesh. Hallelujah. I'm just trying to 
communicate a simple thought this evening. That sometimes the will of God makes no sense. And sometimes the will of God is going to be uncomfortable. And it doesn't look like it's shaping up right like it should. But just because it doesn't look like what you thought, or even sometimes what you wanted, it does not mean God has rejected the sacrifice and your faithfulness and your labor sets before the Lord as a memorial and he will honor faithfulness. I'm here tonight as an encourager. I walk into this building tonight, and if I could, it's almost, if I could describe it, it's almost like you can hear the applause of nail-scarred hands. Ah, you've been downtrodden. You've felt the discouragement. Some of you have given everything you've got and there's still a season you're pressing and you've experienced questions and you've wrestled with feelings even of failure and frustration and you've wondered how some things that you're facing could be a part of God's success story. But I've come to preach to a faithful ministry team and a faithful congregation. There is still yet even greater outpouring of blessing and harvest for Norfolk Apostolic. Let me just say it like this. It may sound like the simplest prophetic statement, but I'm here to tell you the will of God will be done. And the will of God is health and strength and revival and harvest like you've never seen before in your lifetime. It's time. You see, when we're controlled by looks, and I'm nearly done, self-denial doesn't make sense. Sacrifice doesn't make sense when we are controlled by the appearance of things. Faithfulness in the face of adversity seems counterintuitive. Enduring and sacrifice makes no sense. But let me just tell you, that is what God requires at times. But let me just encourage you. When God accepts sacrifice, I feel the Holy Ghost right in this house. When God accepts your labor, and when God accepts your faithfulness, and when God accepts your offering and your worship, when he takes from you, he will always return good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over in due time. So shall my word be. It will not return void. But it will accomplish its intended purpose. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But I'm telling you, he does require our faithfulness first. He requires our worship first in the midst of of the frustration and the calamity. And I go so far as to tell you, he'll test our motives and faithfulness at every stage of advancement. Can you handle the next phase? But hear me. When, oh, I feel the Holy Ghost in this place. When we align ourselves with the economy of heaven, when we position ourselves in the overflow of blessing you ask Job he lost everything but it was returned to him and then some Abraham leave from a place you're comfortable your father has wealth there but listen to me it doesn't look like a plan that makes sense but I've got a land of promise that's gonna astound your mind Moses, you can accept, you can stay in the Egyptian palace as an adopted son. It certainly makes sense and appeals to your flesh. Or you can be the man I've called you to be. And I feel a heavenly mandate in the house to tell the church, you have planted bountifully in the harvest. 
you have planted bountifully in the economy of God. And you will reap bountifully more so than you've sowed in the name of Jesus. The latter house shall be greater than the former house. You be encouraged. You be encouraged. His word is going to come forth. And it's going to produce. And it's going to astound. And so tonight, I just felt, if you want to call it a caution, to, to, to remind the church, don't be controlled by improper vision or misplaced understanding because it'll make you miss out the appearance of things it'll make you miss it but John Blanchard is a name I would introduce to you who did not miss it for the blanket ship he got what he wanted John Blanchard stood on a crowded train platform he was there to meet the girl whose heart he knew well, but whose face he had never seen. Can you imagine? I cannot imagine. Thirteen months ago in a Florida library while reading a book, he became enthralled. Not so much in the book itself, but in the notes that were written in pencil in the margins of that book. He would describe it as soft handwriting reflecting a thoughtful soul. He checked the previous owner. He went full stalker status. And he, he found out that the book had belonged and been donated by a young lady, by, or a lady by the name of Hollis Maynell. He didn't know the age. But Hollis Maynell, so intrigued was he that he found out her address. She lived in New York City. And so he wrote her a letter. I mean, he just felt bold. He invited to begin correspondence with Hollis Maynell, and the next day John Blanchard was shipped overseas for service in World War II. Over one year and a month, they grew to know each other. What would seem to be, in John's mind, a budding romance. And John, being a dude, requested that she send him a photo. And Hollis being a lady, refused to do so. Hollis said it shouldn't matter. In fact, she said, if you care, it won't matter. He never knew the face of this lady, but he liked what he felt from her writing and from her letters. Day came finally for John to return after a year and a month. And so they scheduled their very first meeting. 7 o'clock p.m. in Grand Central Station, New York City. And she wrote to him, John, you'll recognize me by the Red Rose. Some of you are wondering, what in the world is a Red Rose Revival? You'll recognize me by the Red Rose I'll be wearing on my lapel. He advised her that he'd be wearing his uniform and carrying the book that had brought them together. He's never seen her, but he has grown oh so very fond of her. And the time came, and I'll let John describe what happened in his own words. I quote, A young woman was coming toward me, her figure long and slim. Her blonde hair lay back in curls from her delicate ears. Calm down, John, my goodness. Her eyes were blue as flowers. Her lips and chin had a gentle firmness, and in her pale green suit, she was like springtime come alive. I started toward her entirely forgetting to notice that she was not wearing a rose. As I moved, a small, provocative smile curved her lips. Going my way, sailor, she murmured. The devil is a liar. Almost uncontrollably, I made a step closer to her, and then I saw Hollis Maynell. She was standing almost directly behind the girl, a woman well past 40. John was a young man, so all you 40-year-olds, calm down. 
Don't get offended. She had graying hair tucked under a worn hat. She was more than plump. I'm not talking. This is John describing it. Don't get mad at me. He wrote, her thick ankled feet thrust into low heeled shoes while the girl in the green suit was walking quickly away. He said, I felt as though I was split in two. So keen was my desire to follow her, and yet so deep was my longing for the woman whose spirit had truly companioned me and upheld me and got me through the dark days of the war. There she stood. Her pale, plump face was gentle and sensible, and her gray eyes had a warm and kindly twinkle. So he said, I hesitated no longer. My finger gripped the small, worn, blue leather copy of the book, and that was to identify me to her. He said, this would not be love, but it would be something precious, something perhaps better than love, a friendship, he said, for which I had been and must ever be grateful. So I squared my shoulders and saluted and held out the book to the woman, even though while I spoke, I felt choked by the bitterness of my disappointment. I'm Lieutenant John Blanchard, and you must be Miss Maynell. I'm so glad you could meet me. May I take you to dinner, he asked. And the woman's face broadened into a tolerant smile, and she said, I don't know what this is about, son. She answered, but the young lady in the green suit who just went by, she begged me to wear this rose on my coat. And she said, if you were to ask me out to dinner, that I should tell you she's waiting for you in the restaurant across the street. And she said to tell you it was some kind of test. You see, what Miss Maynell knew was that she did not want a man who wanted her just because she was pretty or because she had an attractive figure. She wanted someone that would love her when she was too old to have the figure and when she was no longer as pretty and when her hair had turned gray and her skin didn't have its distinctive youth. She wanted someone who would stay with her because he valued who she was and not what she looked like who would love her not just because of her attractiveness and I feel the Holy Ghost telling me to tell you to remind Nack God is looking for a church that does not just want what's comfortable to the flesh that never stretches our desires and longings but he gives revival to a body of people that says, Jesus, you're my priority and whatever it takes, whatever you got to do. Stand with me. I'll deny my flesh. I'll give what I've got to give. I'll endure what i got to endure because you and because revival and because of harvest are what we value the most. God is searching for in time people that he can trust with in time harvest and that they don't just value the good times and the good going but they'll still pursue God and they'll still obey God when it hurts when it's tough when it makes no sense and when you can't see or outline what God is up to. You see, sometimes revival doesn't come packaged like we think. Sometimes it comes through the agony. And sometimes it comes through the burden. And sometimes it comes through the feeling of being forgotten. And it comes through the discipline of prayer and fasting and sacrifice. But I'm here to tell the church, your next great breakthrough is probably going to be wearing a red rose. So don't give up. Don't get distracted. Because God has seen in you a trustworthiness. May not come like we think or packaged how we expect. It's just some kind of test. And if you'll hang on, 
I'm here to tell somebody revival will be wearing a red rose. Hallelujah. If you feel like God's talked to you, if you feel like God has secured some things in you, would you grab the hand of the person that's, that's next to you and let's go to the altar together. Let's seek the will of God together. Let's seek the future of God together. Let's stand strong together. Let's seek the future that God has in store. It doesn't matter what now looks like. Doesn't matter what now feels like. I've got a calling. I've got a ministry. I've got an anointing. I've got revival in my future in the name of Jesus. Come on, somebody begin to pray right now. Hallelujah. Let the burden of the Holy Ghost, let the power of intercession fall in this place. Oh, come on. I'm not giving up. I'm not getting distracted. Come on, that's it, brother. Find your way back to the calling. Find your way back to the Word of God. It shall not return void. No one else will do. We are overcomers. We shall do valiantly. We shall do exploits. The power of God is working in us. Hey, breakthrough. Reliable. The next level of harvest. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Let there be an outpouring, oh God. Let there be a fresh wind and wave of revival. Miracles, signs, and wonders. Come on, that's it. I feel the spirit of intercession in this house right now. Keep seeking. Keep pursuing. Keep interceding.
It seems easy for us to believe a miracle can happen. A miracle can happen for my brother that needs a healing or my sister that needs a, a blessing. But a lot of times we don't think the miracle can happen for me. Would you close your eyes all across this building? Would you just reach out to the Lord? And if there's a miracle you need, would you ask him? Would you ask him and then by faith begin to thank him for it? Because he knows what you need even before you ask. He said before we ask, the answer's already been sent. Just release your faith. Release your faith. He has a miracle for each of us. My God, my God, my Jesus, Lord, I believe your word. Lord, these have been faithful, those that have been faithful, God. Oh, God. But, Lord, most of all, because of your goodness and your mercies, Lord. Oh, your truth endures to all generations. But your mercy is there, Lord. Oh, it's from the rising and the sun. It's from the very, very beginning that we read in Genesis. And it's to the end of time or what we think is sunset, Lord. The beginning of our lives to the end of our lives. Lord, your goodness is there. And it's because of your mercies, God. Mm, they're for everlasting to everlasting. Thank you for your goodness, Lord. I believe, Lord. Lord, I believe for the things you've spoken in my life. I believe for my family, God. Oh, God, I believe the words that you've spoken over my children and grandchildren, Lord. Lord, my family that's not saved yet, Lord, but I know you're drawing them. I see you working in their lives, Lord. Oh, do the miracle, Lord. Do the miracle that you spoke of. That's it. Just wait on Him. We renew our strength. I don't know if you noticed how beautifully our first word, thank you, Brother Brown. The word that we had from Brother Douglas tonight fit just hand in glove. He's an on time God, he talked about from Ecclesiastes. He makes all things beautiful in his time. And then the red rose of revival, they just fit perfectly together tonight looking for him but I don't see brother Douglas brother Douglas would you step down here sister Douglas Alana 
Saw her with a big camera earlier. I told her we have one rule for photographers, get your picture. So, But if she joins us as well, I want to pray for them. Matter of fact, if you're a new lifer, would you come? If you're from their church, come gather around them. And we're going to pray for them. And I'm going to ask something different tonight. Brother Chris Brown, you had that word that was spoken so beautiful. Would you come? I'm going to ask you to lead us. Lay hands on our presbyter and his wife, his daughter. We're going to pray for them. We're going to pray revival for them. They have a beautiful heritage, as he spoke of earlier. I've known Brother Douglas since he was just a little guy. <laughs> Amen. But God has been good in his life. Amen. Good in his family. But I believe revival is the will of God. Revival begins in us, but God wants us to reach our world. And he's given us. Look at your neighbor and say, you've got it. He's given us the tools that we need for it. Sometimes we're looking for something else, but we've got it. God asked Moses, what's in your hand? David took what was in his hand to beat the giant. What you need, you got. But let's pray in faith that we be encouraged and do the work of God that he has for us. Brother Brown, would you lay hands on him? Father, we come before you tonight. Your word is true. It will do just what you have said. It will accomplish its purpose. Lord, let your purpose be accomplished in our lives. God, for our presbyter tonight, Lord, as he leads this section of churches, God, Oh, into a greater revival, Lord. Give him wisdom, Lord. Give him wisdom beyond his years. Give him men, surround him with men, Lord, that would help him accomplish his purpose, God. And Lord, for our past. greatly to be praised. Oh, blessed be your name. Blessed be your name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, God, let it be done. Let it be done. Bring revival. Your purpose is in all of our lives together. Yes, in the mighty name of Jesus. Praise God. We're going to let you linger if you'd like to linger. Amen. Again, it's so so thankful to have Brother Douglas speaking tonight, have their family with us. Amen. Some of his church family with us as well. Our brothers and sisters. Amen. Amen. Big week ahead of us. We've got Esther. We've got men's retreat. Men looking forward to a great time. And uh, thank you for those that have volunteered. I've got four guys bringing pickups Thursday to help us out. Amen. But we are going to eat like nobody's ate. And we're going to jaw like nobody's jawed. We're going to do a lot of things. But we're going to have food, fun, fellowship, and most of all, faith. Hope it builds your faith, but we're looking forward to having a great time. Young ladies, we'll be praying for you as you travel. Very important meeting for you. I believe it's one. I believe it's the mo probably the most important meeting our young ladies can have is Esther. Amen. Amen. Greet one another. If you'd like to linger in his presence, they're going to play for just a little longer. But even when they're gone, we don't need the music. His presence is always here. He's always with you. Amen. God bless you. We love you.